ambition has always been to create one voice for the creative industries sector. I believe we live in a new age of creativity. I believe the future of our economy lies in creative jobs, jobs which will resist automation and which will require deep creative processes. This is an opportunity for this government to grow this world-class sector. One of the main things we are seeking to do is to put the arts and the creative industries at the centre of the political, the civic, the economic and the social debate. There is nothing nice to have about the arts and the creative industries. There is nothing tangential. There is nothing soft about any of them. This is what is at the heart of the political debate. This is what Britain is associated with around the world. This is absolutely centre to our economy, our public life and our nation's health. It's wonderful to be here. I am a strong supporter of the Creative Industries Federation. I think that uh, for me the biggest uh, opportunity uh, in all of this debate is this uh, thought about uh, collaboration. Uh, and when we talk about the success uh, of the creative industries, I think it is important that those people who work in the creative industries and are now at the very top uh, of the tree in terms of running large organisations that are doing, I think, extremely well, to think about how they can work with the cultural sector to really make an impact. How can we grow arts and culture? How can we grow the creative economy? What policy ideas do we have? And I'm talking about policy ideas, not lobbying. Strong, well-reasoned, well-worked-up policy ideas something the CIF will be working on, but something we should all be working on. But it's policy, policy, policy. Well-reasoned policy, well-argued, based on the evidence of some of which you've been given today. Everybody talks about delivering solutions and, um, and ensuring that arts and creativity is absolutely central to a business. But what we're often not very good at is um, delivering the tangibles to make that happen. We should be influencing beyond the culture piece and into every single part of government if we are going to make a tangible difference. Something we, we created a couple of years ago was the Warner Brothers Creative Talent Program. Each of our areas of, of production, film, television, video games, theater, everybody who uh, has, has now been part of that program have come from the space of the public arts uh, in, in terms of the educational institutions. We're, we're generally looking for people who aren't the sons and daughters of the people who run our industry. And it's a difficult industry to get into. Uh, and so that's where we focus, that's where we develop talent. So today I'll wear my three hats in regards to race, gender, and class, because that's what we're... <laughs> no, because let's speak about diversity in its, its fullest form. Because change takes time and resource, and it takes money, essentially, so, and effort. And so if we look at, you know, if we think of our brains, think of our, ourselves as individuals and think of our brains, we almost operate like the internet. What that means is that instead of working really hard to find new ways and new solutions and new information, we, it's easier for us to just step back into what we already know. And so we can apply that at an individual level and we can also apply that at an organizational level. When budgets are being cut all around us, when recessions are being hit, it means that their investment is needed, time, effort, and resource is needed to make the change because that, that is what it is. It's a change from where we are, from the norm. I do appreciate the work that is being done at the individual level. However, now it's time, forget the individuals, let's not train the targets. It's not about the targets. It's not about who, you know, let's mentor and sponsor and, and, and tell them what they're not doing, um, what they're doing incorrectly to get to the top or to get to the top of the, um, the diversity pool, it's about what are our organizations and what are our societal structures and the power structures that are, uh, that are preventing us from being a truly diverse society. So I do understand the time, resource, money thing. However, I know that if we're willing to spend the money there and put it as a priority, then it can happen. If I could add one point, Melanie, which is th that with arts, culture and creative industries, we're dealing with very casualized industries. And that means that um, for a long time, you hired the person who came to the door via the contact. And that's not good enough. And it, it doesn't get you the best talent either. Uh, and we have to change that. You know, in a small way, I'm pleased the Arts Council's been able to get behind the Creative Employment Programme, which is about paid internships, because if you have paid internships, you genuinely seek out the talent from everywhere rather than um, the bank of mum and dad, you know, which supports unpaid internships. In health, 
Um, if you have to go and have elective surgery, if you have music which you select, played to you, recorded music, you will leave hospital earlier and you will require less medication. We've got to that stage. We can deliver like this. So I think there is a commercial, isn't there a commercial case for the arts beyond the, the if I may say, slightly narrow way in which we've tackled it today? One of the things that Melly and I were talking about earlier was that to a degree here we're preaching to the converted um, and actually the whole issue around how the arts can influence other sectors, other areas is absolutely essential. You know, we've done a lot of work um, on, my, on a personal level within early intervention for whether that be for mental health issues, for substance misuse, for eating disorders. And my um, Havas is now moving towards how we can do something at a very local level in, ter in terms of supporting certain sects of society. But I think we as a group need to focus on how we can deliver tangible gain and demonstrate ROI, if you like, uh, to show the benefit of what we do exactly in those sorts of areas, Tim. One of the things we spent some time uh, considering as part of the Warwick Commission was this issue of how to help arts organisations become more entrepreneurial. Um, this, this, I think, is a real and major challenge for the sector. Uh, I know that the Arts Council, when it went out and assessed the sector as a whole, found that there were not actually many that were, could be described as investment-ready. Um, this is a completely different way, if, if you would like, of us thinking about how to maximise the value of the work that we produce. And I wondered if the panel had any thoughts about how we might help the industry as a whole to develop those skills, which are complex, uh, really important. At the core of the arts argument, it's about empowering creatives and so that they know what their value is and what their worth is and how much the arts and culture contribute to the UK economies. That's what it's about. I think it's about the economic empowerment rather than fostering that that pure classic entrepreneurial system that we, because we, we do use that word a lot and entrepreneurs start businesses after businesses after businesses. And per, certainly I don't think that's what the report is, is advocating. It's more about putting the economy around the arts, the economic value around the arts and culture industry so that we understand how much they contribute to the UK and we value them as such. And we put the requisite investment that's required to keep that economy going and to make it grow in the future. We've heard a lot about entrepreneurship, we've heard a lot about finance departments, but my attention is drawn by this line. Firms with one or no employees make up 91% of the businesses operating within the wider sectors from which we take our definition of the arts and culture industry. And I just want to make a plea for those small industries. There are so many film, theatre, music producers, people like me, that are finding money in new places, in innovative places. And please don't forget our views um, and take account of us when, when you're talking at the table. It's not just big companies that have a finance department that need to learn how to, to run an SPV. Those of us that are our own finance departments, our own IT, IT departments, our legal departments, I'm sure that's many people in this room today, we, we have those skills within us that we've developed ourselves, and we're making as small uh, commercial creative industries, we have a vital contribution to make as well. I don't think anybody would disagree with you at all. I think we're in total agreement. And I think um, what is probably very important is that um, representatives who are part of the council, like Havas or any of the other agencies, use and support the individuals as much as they possibly can as well because we, you know, you go back to the point that we talked about at the beginning about talent and nurturing talent and ensuring that we get the right ability. It is beholden on us to ensure that we share, deliver and collaborate and partner in the true sense. But here's the thing. It's all very well to say, eh, remember us, we're important. It's not about that. It's about the evidence. Good. I think we built a pretty good evidence base. And now it's about really coherent policies that are based on that evidence. Let's own this and let's own the arts. Let's own what we bring into the UK. Let's own what we bring in globally as well in terms of being London. Let's, let's really have pride in regards to where we are in terms of our business case and how we present it. And I think that, that will leave us in good stead. Thank you.